Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how is a trauma-informed relational approach supporting schools post-COVID? And I'm in conversation with Molly McLeod and Anna Gregory. Hi, I'm Molly McLeod. I'm a restorative practice service lead uh, for education in Gloucester County Council. Uh, I've been doing the role for about four or five years now. Um, and we are in a number of schools, about 35 different schools in Gloucestershire at the moment, ranging from primaries through secondaries, alternative provisions and special schools. Um, and we work with the professionals within the education hub who also go into schools. Very right. much my job. I'm Anna Gregory. I'm the restorative coordinator for Peacemakers, which is an educational charity that's based in Birmingham. Um, and we work predominantly with schools in the West Midlands, um, but also with some community groups um, and youth groups in particular. Um, and I'm coming up for my 10th year of supporting schools with restorative practices um, and helping them to become restorative in, in whatever way they can. Um, and yeah, peace is kind of our core understanding of what restorative is. So um, you can't start early enough learning the skills and attitudes and values of peace um, before we get taught how to do conflict really well in society. So we start with peace first. Wow. Okay. So that sounds deep. So, so the whole episode today is all about how um, sort of trauma informed relational approach um, can support schools uh, post COVID. But let's just take that back a little bit and just assume, you know, that, that some of the people listening in might be wanting to learn a little bit more about the very basics here. So could you tell us a little bit about, um, yeah, sort of what do we mean by restorative practice and relational work and what is peace? <laughs> I think um, for me, restorative practice is a set of principles, really, and approaches. It's aimed at, at positively building, maintaining and repairing relationships. So it's, it's a way of being with each other uh, that builds empathy, care, understanding of and acknowledges our own unique perspective of the world. So it's, you know, and around and listening and um, Yeah, I guess, I don't know, Anna, do you want to expand on the peace part? That's your... So, yeah, um, well, peace means peace means many things to many people and we wouldn't dictate what peace means to anybody. It's open to interpretation and very cleverer people than me can't even agree what peace means. So I wouldn't even try and uh, try and pin that one down. Um, so we start from the premise that peace is a possibility for us and that um, is quite hopeful, but we, it's not really a destination. It's not something that you arrive at, it's something that you work towards. So within that, you can think about restorative practices and relational ways of working as well. It's something we've got to keep doing. Um, and yeah, it's lovely working with children and with the adults who support them, asking them what peace means, um, because it means different things to different people and in different schools at different times in different communities. Um, so peace for children can mean jumping on a trampoline. Peace can mean being quiet in my room. Peace can be sitting with my dog. Um, peace can mean peace and quiet for adults. Um, but, you know, I, I think peace is whenever you feel most at your most like yourself, most connected with who you are, most like you can flourish, most like you are working at your best. So for me, peace is quite noisy and peace is quite chaotic and quite laughter filled and um, a bit sort of all over the place. And it's that moment in a circle, for example, where people are talking and laughing and busy. And yeah, so my peace is different to what other people's peace is. And I think schools, it's worth acknowledging that restorative practices in the UK, um, schools have kind of come at it predominantly, first of all, from like a behaviour lens and kind of a way of managing behaviour. And I think Molly and I are on the same page and we'd like to steer that discussion more to be about how people can relate to the core qualities and kind of the starting point of, of what we see restorative as. So yeah, schools might see it as an alternative way to think about addressing discipline um, and behavior, behavioral issues. But like Molly said, we 
would be encouraging conversations where and practices where people can really be supported to build positive healthy relationships with one another maintain them when they go a bit wobbly and then repair them you know it, you know when when thing when harm has happened and things have gone wrong i Does think it right with you molly Is, are you in yeah the well i i think what um the reason that we wanted to talk to you pookie was because during um both our journeys with restorative practice um, particularly going into a number of schools I have found that we now have to um, well, when we're delivering restorative practice training is we deliver it alongside trauma-informed um, training yeah. because it's about understanding how the other person is showing up to the relationship and mechanisms to kind of opportunities really for schools to be able to strengthen those relationships like Anna was talking about circle work we use circles a lot in school to listen to each other, to build emotional literacy, oracy skills, role modeling, good behaviors, um, and, and ultimately listening to each other. And if somebody is showing up not having had a good weekend or a good night for whatever reason, it's an opportunity for us to acknowledge that and to understand that that might be um, informing the way that they behave throughout the day. And we might need to spend a bit more time kind of giving them space to be able to move through and work through whatever issue that they are showing up to school with that day in order for them to then be able to access their learning. So it's just about understanding where everybody is in order to be able to achieve what needs to be achieved, really. And I'm interested, Molly, in terms of the sort of um, thinking about it cynically, like the, the business case for your role, because at a time when um, councils have less and less budget to spend on um, these sort of specialist practitioner roles, it's interesting that your your role continues to exist. And I'm assuming that means that, you know, you've had some great results and the council can see real benefit to what you're doing. We have. We've also had a huge surge in interest since COVID because okay. they are understanding the importance of relationships and their understanding this notion of collective trauma now. So um, people are turning up to school that they've never had a problem with, who are bouncing off the walls or who are behaving in ways that they are alien to them. And it's about, well, how do I really understand what's then going on for this child? And the, the trauma informed aspect is understanding what neurologically might be happening for that child um, developmentally, um, but, and how that behavior is then manifesting itself. And restorative practice is about the language and the, the way of being with that child in order to be able to interact with them, to regulate their emotions, to be able to relate to them, and ultimately to be able to sit down and reflect on what's happened and what is going on for them in a, a, a non-confrontational way. It uses um, non-blaming language and you know we're, we're curious rather than judgmental in our conversations. And so actually post covid we've had more demand for our service than we can actually deliver at the moment so we're having to be quite creative in how we do that and that's where people like anna come in to kind of support and respond really to what schools are asking for and certainly relationships become a huge focus for us um, post pandemic and continues to be i think also there's been a a sort of a bit of a rude awakening for some adults as well in that they maybe for the first time are experiencing anxiety heightened stress um you know some things that weren't there before are starting to come up for them and so there is a different kind of way of looking at some of the behaviors that they may have prejudged about yes yeah, some of the young people in the school but also some of their colleagues Mm. people in their families and so when we're working all of us at this heightened stress level um i think there is there seems to be a willingness to kind of take stock and be a bit more compassionate and like look at some of our friends and colleagues behaviors and think all right well that's not normal no it's not normal because the time's not normal you know and and so yeah this this experience i think is kind of triggering some interesting responses um in adults in particular who yeah 
And what support can we give to adults th to get this right, though? Because it, it, it seems from, from what you're saying, and I guess from my experience at the moment as well, that our children's need is greater than it has been at the past. And for, for many, it's the first time we're really seeing this kind of need from them. But that actually the adults who want to be there and empathise and be compassionate and build these relationships, those adults are struggling too. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that must make your work additionally challenging. Well, we it's about role modeling really so it's about role modeling the behavior that you want to see and actually in order to be able to take care of others you need to be able to take care of yourself and so our start point um post covid particularly in any school is staff well-being circles so we we are um working with the school to look at creating space and opportunity for staff to get together in a safe way the thing with circle work is because there are rules of the circle there's a predictability to it it creates this community of safety and people are able to be more themselves they're able to bring them their whole self if you like to that space and and they're able to kind of talk about the issues that they don't have space or time to talk about in their job they're very busy teachers but to be able to um, have time usually two to three times a week where they can sit down with colleagues and just reflect on what's happening for them and to kind of talk to others and listen to each other's stories it's very powerful we've um we've been running quite a lot of sessions around staff well-being so them understanding their own trauma and their own response to it and like anna was saying for a lot of them they've kind of got to the stage where they're kind of like okay i'm recognizing that i'm not okay and there are lots of messages certainly you know my um organization has been very aware of staff well-being and the need for us to take time and to, to nurture our relationships in a way that's just a bit more explicit than it was before you know before you might take time to say hi to somebody or talk about your weekend over a cup of tea in the kitchen or mm. but we don't have that now that we're all working virtually and so actually we're having to build that in but in order to build in we have to acknowledge that it's a need mm. and so i think we are finding that in schools that actually they're getting to the point where they're so exhausted and they're just saying our biggest concern at the moment is staff well-being so that's where we're starting and that's that's all that we're offering really a restorative practice is a whole spectrum of of kind of approaches tools practices principles but really it's about relationships and we're starting with our relationship with ourselves so all of the things that we're doing with the staff they can then do with their classes and but it's important that they understand that they are taking that time for themselves at the moment so what does that kind of look like in practice could you tell me about uh you know a, an example of what a staff well-being circle kind of looks like mm -hmm. you said there are kind of clear sort of rules of engagement and uh yeah expectations there anna do you want to do the rules of the circle it's your bag <laughs> So, okay, well, we have to kind of take ourselves back or, or at least look through through two lenses here, like pre-COVID and post-COVID. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> because there's a physical, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's physical aspects to it. So the idea is, is that we, we clear, we change our physical environment um, when we create the circle. So that's moving tables and chairs back, ideally, or finding space that people can um, have enough room to create a circle. If we're sitting on chairs, we will create um, a sense of equality all using the same chairs. So adult, not on a different chair. And we are trying to share early on implicit messages that, you know, we are working um, more democratically, we're flatter, um, there's respect for everybody and everybody's voice can be heard. So we set out our circle physically, we uh, have the same amount of gaps in between the chairs and we could have something in the middle to look at um, to help focus attention if um, and this is you know working with with trauma in mind if kind of eye contact or uh, is, is too intense or we're, we're worried about the focus that a circle can can sometimes give we can have a centerpiece or not um, and then the facilitator and we're using the word facilitator rather than teacher or instructor um, the facilitator might pose a check-in question and this is an opportunity for everybody to respond to this question how they want to or pass they have free pass without judgment or comment um, in responding to this question uh, 
again in pre-COVID times, a physical talking piece would be used. So we would use this and some people might have heard of like a talking stick or something like that. People use shells, beautiful rocks or balls or anything that can be passed round and is um, a visual cue that when you hold the talking piece, you are in speaking mode and that helps everybody else go into listening mode. So the talking piece goes around and we all hold it so that we're all connected and we respond to this question. And the question's low risk. The question is something that everybody feels they can answer. Um, and it goes like around. So um, what's your favorite pizza topping? Um, what's your favorite times table? Uh, how did you earn your first pound? Something that can generate excitement and that we all feel we can contribute to. But the idea is that we're building social connection as well. So in all of these practices, we're looking for ways that we possibly could look or, or, or turn to our neighbour and think, I just didn't know that about you. I feel differently about you. I feel good about knowing this. I feel good about sharing this piece of information about myself. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we do this check-in and then we would play um, games that are designed to um, help develop social and emotional literacy um, and for us at Peacemakers we'd be using and I know in Molly's work as well the what's known as the restorative framework or inquiry is used to help us kind of understand what our responses are to these exercises and these activities so we're explicitly exploring and saying okay I'm, I'm playing this game and I didn't win and I'm gonna talk through how I feel about that <laughs> because I really want to play that game again and I'm realizing that I'm really competitive and you know so or or you know I feel fine about playing that game I quite like it when you know so and so wins that's quite funny um but we're, we're generating understanding of self and others through a really dynamic experiential way and what happens? Sorry, go on, Molly. Sorry, I was going to say it's, it's particularly focusing on on emotions and feelings. And the thing that's very interesting is that adults, in particular, find it very difficult to talk mm. about feelings. They quite often describe their feelings as thoughts, and so the games are designed to to really kind of break that down and really look at um, how they're interacting with each other and what they find comfortable, what they find uncomfortable, and to notice what other people find comfortable and uncomfortable so that they they're really understanding you know some people have they don't like people being too close some people have different personal space boundaries you know it's and it's about being aware of people on a different level it's it's connecting with people um, in a different way and I think it's really important that when we're doing any kind of circle work that we're doing the connection and the the kind of sense of belonging creating that community before we go into any kind of conversation around sensitive issues or things that may uh, bring up you know issues that are going to make people feel too vulnerable you need to be safe enough in a circle to share whatever you like and that's why one of the, one of the kind of rules if you like of the circle is that you don't need to share if you don't want to if you don't feel comfortable you can pass or you you can just listen on that occasion and that's perfectly fine it's about engaging as to however much you feel safe to engage in that particular topic and what happens if you've got people who are invited along to the circle who just don't want to be there well, adult or child or... <laughs> I can imagine, it, I mean, <laughs> whichever feels more relevant to share. <laughs> I, but I think this is, the, this is where the, the, what I was saying before comes into its own, really, is quite often what happens is people don't feel safe immediately in a circle if they're not used to it. It's, an, it's a different concept. It's, it's unfamiliar to them. But generally speaking, in my experience, is as they, they listen to begin with, or they might say you know some kind of very um sort of basic things about themselves that aren't going to leave themselves open or vulnerable and as they feel safer they disclose more and that's absolutely fine and you know we have had people um new people who've joined a group or a team my team we use circles all of the time so new people that come into the team 
you know, they don't necessarily divulge everything about themselves at the beginning, but over time they feel safe enough to be able to do so. And it's the same with anybody coming into that environment. I just did um, some training online introducing restorative approaches to school this week, last week. And um, there's that kind of qualifier at the end of the training when they say things like, when I, when I first came into the circle, Anna, you know, when I first met you, I thought it was going to be, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous or we were, you were going to make us do <laughs> things that I didn't want to do. And, and the thing is, you know, it's about, it's about low risk and it's, a, and it's about people experiencing success quickly and safely. It, it's emotional safety as well as, you know, physical and academic safety as far as I'm concerned. So the checking question, everybody should be allowed, you know, able to respond to or pass. The games, everyone can play if they want to or pass out of. So there's no kind of test. No one's going to fail at circle time or being in a circle. Um, and I think that the young people, whatever age, are able to engage with it quicker and in a more meaningful way than some some of us older ones who might have you know been knocked about a bit and we kind of realized that you know it's not okay to speak up at team meetings or we've been in a, a particularly toxic work environment and it's not you know we just don't feel safe whether we're aware of that or not so it's it's just appreciating that those adults come with as many um you know walls up and barriers up as the young people and if you know I, like I, I watched like some people sit with their coats done up for a good 40 minutes bags on their you know chairs and, and they're not going to move like they're just not going to move but it's about safety isn't it so it's part of my job is to create that environment where they feel relaxed enough and safe enough to talk to somebody next to them or to move across the circle and if they don't this time you know that's okay they might they might next time um, a pet, you know, a difficult one is when an adult explicitly says at the start, I'm not going to be in the circle and I'm going to go over here and do my marking. And so that for me takes a, I have to have a bit of a breath and think how I'm going to challenge that because that's not okay. You can't be in this room and spectate on our circle you're either in our circle or you're not. And for safeguarding, I need you in this circle. <laughs> so, so, you know, and that's like, I'm a guest in a school and I'm running out of time. So we've got to work this out, how we're going to get you in this circle and take part as best as you can, even though you might, you might think it's, you know, it's not for you. Presumably it's very important to have those adults on board as well, because you're there for the circle but then they're going to need to continue with that work and translate that into their kind of everyday practice I, I I would guess and I mean what's wonderful about it though is 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 those moments where a young person expresses themselves or talks different in a different in a way that surprises that adult who might be a bit cynical so you know they may think that they are a particular way or they're unable to you know to do something and then they that that young person speaks from the heart or speaks to somebody else or performs a task brilliantly and you know that comment after the, the end of the session where the the adults like i never i never knew i never knew they were like that i never knew they had that in them and and you know there's lots of opportunities in our school day for for those like moments and we've just got to i think what restorative practices do is they give us those structured um spaces to elicit those moments where someone can really like molly was saying show up and show who they really are and i think that's why it's important that we start with the staff because the best way to understand how to facilitate a circle yourself is to be part of one to understand how they function to have maybe said something that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable and put it out there and see the reaction and not be interrupted and talked over by everybody and told that your opinion is not worthy or you're wrong or because that again is because we go around sequentially by the time somebody has had an emotive reaction to something that you've said by the time it's got to their turn they've maybe had time to think about well what's the actual issue that I want here so it, it's a very measured way of having a conversation and it's a very it's a very good way of hearing everybody's perspective on a situation before you as the facilitator or as the manager in a team meeting have to then 
make a decision having heard everybody's thoughts on it. So yeah, experiencing a circle is most definitely the best way to learn how and how they function um, and what benefits they can bring for children, young people. And what are the kind of, you know, in terms of building these ideas into sort of everyday practice, if you like, what are the things that the skills and the ideas that you find yourself sort of teaching and supporting most often? Like what can people do every day that would make a difference here? I think, I mean, the circle is like a physical manifestation of a group, like of a community. And that is always is sending a message. And we, we are able to move from kind of, me and I thinking to we thinking so um you know when we play a game we experience success when or we feel you know we are working better as a group when and I think that can translate to so many other instances um or or ways that we respond in schools to move from the idea of I think I believe I know to well you know what what do we think what do we know and and opening out our our thinking to include others um because you know as restorative people we we restorative practitioners we believe that our behavior impacts and affects other people and we are social beings and we are massively um you know whether that's electronic you know ele electrically sending out message like vibes and stuff or hormonally or whatever we're we're communicating to each other all the time and um just to be just to be you know clear about that the the way i walk into a room or the way i am this morning affects you you know and you affect me so i just think moving into that space of we is is quite is quite it's quite important for for some schools to to ex experience i think it's important for all of us really and i think that actually you know as a manager i i start all of my meetings with a check-in and i finish all of my meetings with a checkout and the purpose of a check-in just is to really test the temperature of the room who have i got today um and the check-in might be a positive um or a, or a personal thing it doesn't always have to be thematic it doesn't always have to be work related like Anna was saying, it's quite interesting when it's, it's, you've learned things about your colleagues that you would never learn, you know, what kind of language would you like to be fluent in and why, you know, those kinds of things are interesting. It gives you a depth to your relationships, but it also, you know, I know a colleague of ours always starts every day, his uh, check-in is give me a positive and a preoccupation. And so by the time he's gone round his team, he knows how everybody in his team is showing up. He knows who he needs to maybe have a follow-up conversation with or who he can just let off you go yeah great you're, you're on it today and then the checkout is just how people have been affected by whatever's been discussed in the meeting or in the circle in the session and making sure that everybody's okay making sure that you're safe to close the circle really is there anybody that you need to follow up on and that's for adults as well as young people and you don't need to necessarily convene a circle like Anna was saying post COVID where we do everything on Zoom it just means now when I do a team meeting I go around and I ask people individually to contribute to the check-in we don't use a talking piece but we still listen the same way and the person who's talking everybody else is on mute you know you still have the same structure to it um, and it, it has the same function it's just yeah I find it really useful I wouldn't ever have a meeting without one really and can do you use so you said your colleague uses the the same uh, check-in each time but you're using different things what kind of things would you have, have you used recently as, as a check-in just to give some examples <laughs> there's a brilliant book um I don't know who the author is but it's a thousand and one questions and I'm pretty sure it's available on the internet you can find it it's fantastic and it just ranges what I do now, because we've been using them for a long time in my team, I ask people for a check-in question. So it could be anything from tell me an aha moment you've had recently to tell me, you know, what you did at the weekend or what are you planning for Christmas? Or, you know, we ha we've done the one that Anna said about your first, where did you earn your first pound? You know, tell us about your first relationship or it depends on how deep you want to go who you're talking to and and what kind of mood you want to set really I suppose if you're meeting people that you don't know you would set one you know my very first checking question was what was your favorite childhood sweet 
well, everybody's got one, haven't they? And, and you, you know, in a group of 24 people that you've never met before, that gives you an instant connection when somebody else says fruit salad. And you go, yes, that's my oh, yeah. girl. Or, <laughs> or your favorite TV show or the first record that you bought. And then you get the young ones that go, record? What's a record? <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it can be anything. I listen out for check-in questions. So I have a list. I've just looked on my phone. I have a list on my phone that I basically, you know, I turn up to training and I, I however I feel, you know, I, like Molly said, you want to set the mood. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have, I have particular favourites at any one time. I think that the thing is about the, the check-in is that it is a question. And, and this, is, this is what I was think I was trying to get to with this whole thing about we. Like, we want to enter into dialogue with people when we're operating restoratively. It's not a monologue. It's not me telling, telling, telling. So, you know, a key aspect of working restoratively is being curious and, and inquiring in a safe way and, 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 you know, doing that as authentically as you can. So yeah, we have, we have these questions that we ask that are basically open questions. Um, but we also, when we're, when we're skilled restoratively, like we are making adaptations to the way that we talk, you know, the way that we um, listen, our, our body language as well. And we, we're trying to show that person or that group of people that we care about you that we respect you you know as a human being and that you have value to to us and to our community so that, that's why we ask you questions because your voice is important um so so we're very much about entering into dialogue when we're operating restoratively and in terms of the the kind of current context because a lot it, it feels like a lot of the the work that you're doing is about helping adults to be the adults that they need to be for themselves but also for the the children and young people in their care um, and i was just wondering how you feel that the adults that children need how that role has changed in light of the the pandemic are children needing different things from the adults around them or kind of just more of what you were looking to build before it's the same emotional availability you know in in trauma work we talk a lot about the emotionally available adult and and the strength of relationships people feeling that that they've got that secure place that that safe adult that they can open up to and whether that's another adult or whether that's a child um being able to kind of have that predictability and stability is really important for all of us routine is you know routine and connection and communication are all part of the, the kind of recovery process if you like um, and and these opportunities what we're having fed back to us and what we're hearing a lot of is that the, the routine of the circles where you know you're going to have an opportunity to say how you're feeling for others to listen and for that to be acknowledged by the group is really important to people whether they've got something important to say or like you know life-changing to say or something that they really need to discuss or not is it's just turning up and having that routine is is really um helpful so i wouldn't say you know that restorative practice is needing to change necessarily um it's just we are becoming more aware of the importance of it the importance of having strong relationships and positive secure adults to be able to communicate with and is there, there any challenge in terms of finding the time because this doesn't sound like quick fix kind of work um and obviously at the moment it feels that time is more pressured than ever you know there's all this talk of catch up and time lost and yeah things feel very pressured yeah and i think you know that's it's valid isn't it like anything it does take time if you're going to really listen and you're going to um really try and understand what's actually going on you know we talk about behavior as being a display of unmet need you know and it's kind of like well then you've got to unpick that haven't you and try and find out what's actually going on for that person in order to be able to help them move through whatever's happening for them um but i think you know if you talk to teachers or um people who work restoratively in this way they will all say that the time you invest in the beginning in that relationship is comes back to you tenfold you know because the the young people who are able to talk about their feelings to talk about the impact that a particular issues had or incident has had on them who are able then to work through that in a restorative way and uh, repair the harm that's been done to that relationship that 
that's a much quicker and more sustainable um, outcome, a positive outcome for that relationship than it is if it goes unchecked. And, you know, harm is caused in relationships all the time, particularly between young people who are finding it difficult to regulate their emotions. Um, but being able to have that small window where you reflect on what's happened and you're able then to listen to the other person and talk about the impacts of the harm on both sides and be able to repair it, both parties can move forward without there having to be the escalation to senior leaders or investigation by you know lots of other people and and so actually in the long run it it saves time i don't know Anna, if you've got anything you wanted yeah. to i was just reflecting talking about how the conversations that i was having with school leaders over the summer and lockdown one as it's being called <laughs> um, and just that yeah faced with just what like what was happening covid wise but also what was coming at them um, you know, from from higher powers um, and from parents in the community as well. I was, I, I wouldn't say shocked, but I was impressed that the majority of the schools that we work with said the first thing we do is get in a circle. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the, la you know, once you've been down this road, the language, the landscape changes and your language changes. So you're able to just say, I'm not doing anything until i know how everybody is and then we will make a better plan together if i am constantly firefighting and reacting um then you know i know the cycle i can get into and our school can get into so the majority of senior leaders were saying we are circling up you know we are talking about impact we are talking about how this has affected us and then we are making a plan to move forward so I, I'm just, you know, I'm so chuffed with those senior leaders because that's a full on brave move to say, you know, I'm pressing pause on this and I'm going to, um, you know, figure out for myself what we're going to do rather than responding. Um, and and that's brave and thoughtful um, because that's not the message that, that a lot of people get. And that is that, you know, you need to improve standards, you know, and you know make sure that everybody's in on time and doing all that kind of stuff it's like they they they're willing to engage in a different conversation which i just think is awesome yeah i and i would reiterate that as well we've got a lot of our school leaders are saying you know we need can you help support us to revisit our circles particularly for staff particularly for um you know re-timetabling and how do we fit them into um, the curriculum and what can we do around tutor time differently and because they're recognizing that actually this just talking to each other and taking time out for relationships is hugely important now more than ever and they are almost emboldened by you know the words of trauma and crisis and pandemic and things have kind of gone right well now is the time to do what i've always believed i feel brave because i almost have an impetus to kind of go for it and nobody's going to judge me because it's needed and it's quite clear that it's needed and actually you know it's going to be of benefit to my school community um to embed it and the time is right the time is now and we're uh, Sorry, Sorry, people have also had you know we've all had different thoughts about how we want to work how we want to live you know uh how we want to structure our time and educators have been re re-engaging with the notion of education you know how do why am i in this why do i want to do this what what floats my boat about educating and and for some you know the the that 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 answer is I'm leaving and I'm going off and I'm doing something else. And for some it's like, I'm digging in, you know, I believe in this and this is, this is the purpose of education in this country is to, you know, seek to connect young people with themselves and with their learning and become self-motivated. Um, and I think that is another aspect, isn't it? Certainly in the schools that, are, that I've seen, the secondary schools in particular that are restorative, is the young people have a voice. They know they have a voice, they use their voice, and they are using their voice. And I think what we're going to see is them, you know, on social pl media platforms and at kind of outside of their school communities talking about what they need my daughter's in year 11 she's upstairs on an inset day revising for her gcses that may or may not happen 
and that they're, they're very vocal about it and they really opinionated about it i've never i was never that engaged in politics or you know the world kind of <laughs> community when I was her age and it's because it's affecting them and I think that restorative practice is giving young people the skills the oracy skills to be able to understand how to fight for what they believe is right and to stand up for what they need and to ask for what they need. I think it's also worth making a link to social justice as well in some mm -hmm. some areas of, of restorative is very much about how do we level the playing field or you know allow people or, or not allow but you know amplify certain voices and just with what's happened over the pandemic we have seen massive inequality between groups and so yeah the, 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 the conversation is very ripe and very rich and people are willing to contribute um, so, and, and you know restorative practices provide that training ground to be able to do that to listen well and respond thoughtfully to some of these issues um it can present a challenge in schools you know when you ask people what they think and they tell you <laughs> yes that can be tough, that can be tough. um you know, but what what kind of you know again it's about engaging with this notion of like what is the purpose of education what type of young people do we want to be supporting to grow up to be our future teachers and nurses and you know I'll say politicians and you know podcast entrepreneurs and all the rest of it like you know we want them to have a voice and be able to communicate in the best way that they can absolutely and it, it feels like then it's it's kind of a golden moment in time almost for the sort of work that you're doing that perhaps people um are more receptive more open to it that young people uh, you know would, would perhaps really well engage with it and the adults around them would be perhaps more open to this way of thinking do you think it's important that we find ways to make sure that this isn't just done for a little while because this is this needs to remain right this this you can't just do it for a while now and then everything will be fine right yeah, and I, I think we're, that's what we're in the community of restorative practitioners. That's what we're looking at at the moment. Um, you know, one of the things that's been great about having to do everything virtually is that it doesn't matter whether you're in France or in Birmingham or in Gloucestershire or Australia, you can come together as a network and you can promote what you're doing. And so with through restorative ed is um, our Twitter handle. We're, we're looking at a national network of practitioners around restorative practice. We're looking at how do we share best practice. There's a lot of good practice around the UK and it's about us all now coming together and saying that, you know, we're talking to um, Barry Carpenter about his recovery curriculum. And, you know, there is a, a general acknowledgement that re restorative approaches, they build resilience, they build emotional literacy, they build, you know, positive school communities this is what we're asking for this is what we want we can respond to the rise in conflict in you know day-to-day -day interactions in a more constructive way and we just need to come together and sort of showcase how it can benefit communities we're we're busy at the moment um putting all of our research and um, sort of evaluation together of the impact that it's had in Gloucestershire because it does reduce exclusion it does promote inclusion and improve attendance and it improves things like staff well-being student well-being you know it all of those things it's good for our communities why would we not want it Absolutely. just about like you say getting the message out there and how, if people are listening in and this isn't something that's already happening where they are, how, how do you get started? Cool. <laughs> well, <laughs> in, <a> <laughs> I suppose from my perspective, then, you know, we have Restorative Gloucestershire in um, our county, which is an organisation run by the police. You can look up them. You can... Um, have a look on the Gloucestershire County Council website, restorative practice. We're doing a huge amount. We've come together over the summer as a group of uh, national le school leaders and consultants around restorative practice to create something called Restore. So there's a website, uh, Restore Our Schools, which is, uh, you know, concentrating on post-COVID, transitioning safely back into school communities using restorative approaches. I mean, if you type the word restorative thinking, working, anything into google you'll it will bring you up a number of um amazing charities and organizations and people who are working in local authorities 
um, and across other organisations restoratively, I think that the the question now is is how we join together really and how we support people coming into the field that want to take this forward um, and that's why we've created restorative ed is is to create this national network the restorative justice council um, is our overseeing body i guess so that would be a good place to start if anybody's interested um so I think Anna? it's worth like when when people first come across this word restorative for some people they're like i've been doing this you know i just haven't had a name for it you know i've yeah. thought it through it this way that's nice that i've got a name but i'm just going to carry on with what i've been doing thanks and some people are like oh that's what i've been doing i didn't realize now it's got a name and off they go to dr google and kind of you know go wild for it um i think it's it's you know we've got a good sort of 20 30 year history here of working restoratively in, in the criminal justice system, but also in education in the UK. But we're a little bit late to the party. It's been happening, you know, in Canada and, and, and New Zealand and Australia for, for, you know, a long, long, long time. And certainly the stuff that's happening in America, like in California, I'm finding really exciting around restorative um, work in schools. So I, like Molly said, the exciting thing about working remotely is that suddenly, yeah, I'm looking at what's happening in Oakland and just so inspired by the way that they're able to really progress their restorative practice in schools um, compared to, you know, perhaps how it's been working or what's been my experience in, here in the Midlands. So, um, yeah, do, do, some, do some research and then, and then talk to me and Molly and we'll put, point you in directions of our favourite. Uh, and I'll certainly link to all the links that you sent me and any that you send me after I'll put in the, in the show notes so that people can, can access them. I think it is really important just to acknowledge that when you work restoratively, you're starting a relationship with the, that person. And so wherever they are starting from is where you begin the journey. And it's whatever they want to embed. Do they want to start with circles? Are they having a really tough time with another member of staff that they need some reparative work done? You know, what is it that they want? Do they want to affect whole school culture change or do they just want to look at a more robust transition program for their year sixes coming into secondary school post covid how specific do they want to be um, and we will work with them wherever they are it's about each start point being different and each relationship being different and so restorative and and what it means to you is different for everybody essentially so there's so no find a fit no and find a fit that that works for you you know we go into some primary schools who've done an awful lot of thrive training elsa training you know they're trauma-informed practitioners and they just want the language to be able to have the conversations when these situations arise we we go into other schools where they don't have a particularly strong re relational or inclusive behavior management policy or you know and they're in a very different start point so and again it works the same for teams it works the same for families you know the restorative approaches the things that you you are you you behave in a particular way and it's for all of your relationships it's not just for some I was thinking about it actually as you were talking about how one of the things that is a real joy in our family so we live three generations in one home and we make a real big thing of actually all sitting around and having meals together as much as we can and one of the things that one of my daughters especially likes is um, if we pose a question so yep. she asked me this year to do as I did for last advent which was every day to have a question mm -hmm. and it sounds like basically we're, we're running a circle aren't we? <laughs> yes you are yes and it's it's really powerful and people like it and particularly young people because they have a voice and every member of the you know it's very easy in my family I've got a 14 year old 15 year old and a six year old and it's very easy for the six year old's voice to get lost while everybody else is gabble 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 mm -hmm. and so actually when you do it and you are just acknowledging everybody around the table um, everybody feels included and it feels good yeah. I just we're just experimenting with something that's um, poached a wee bit from philosophy for children actually but it's this idea of sticky questions that um, children go home with a question stuck you know post-it notes to their uniform and this question is exactly that it's a question designed to, pro 
designed to provoke a response and it's almost like they can interview people back home so you, you know um is it is it okay that you know um like should slugs be treated fairly and you know should we <laughs> so, so they can go home and they can have these kind of discussions and then come back monday morning and it's again it's just you know if you want to talk look, look at it really black and white it's just a mechanism Mm. to create social engagement and so um you know yes like those those questions at dinner they are the mechanism but the feelings that go along with that when you hear what your you know your kids say or what you know what what your your the, the next generation up hears and when they question that like that is very you know um like how, what that generates in us is what we're after like it's those kind of affective responses that we're trying to help build connection between each other the questions are just the mechanism to do it you know <laughs> and i the last thing i was kind of wondering about and i think you, you've maybe sort of answered this really but um is about a lot of the the work that you're doing it feels like it needs to happen at a kind of community or, or sort of setting level and, and really led by the middle and senior leaders within an organization but if you know loads of the people who'll be listening into this will be teaching assistants or school nurses or you know people who sit lower in that kind of hierarchy but who want to make a difference and do make a difference in what they do every day what's their role here if perhaps they're working somewhere that doesn't get this or isn't doing it yet every conversation counts yeah. and every person that they can have a different conversation with and they can find that way through that conflict in a non-confrontational non-blaming way where there's learning at the end of it and the harm is repaired and healed will help those young people all those staff members whoever they are if I, I still remember, you know, key adults in my school career and I moved around a lot as a kid. I think I attended something like 11 schools in all. So in different countries and at different, you know, points in the, in the UK education system. And the people that I remember are the care, like two caretakers that really stand out to me because they made time. They made time to listen to me. They gave me, you know, I was the kid that needed a special job. Like they gave me special jobs. They listened to me. Um, and and you know, like my my memory of them as an adult and what they taught me was that I mattered, you know, that I mattered as an individual as a weird eleven year old. I was cool in their eyes and they wanted to hear what I had to say. That somebody believed that I had agency, that I could take on a job, you know, and 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 report on it. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter what your role is. If you can see another young, per you know, see a young person um, in, in with the eyes that they matter, like that is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant thing to do. You don't need to, you know. And I would say, as well as senior leaders, key members of staff that we train are lunchtime supervisors and TAs, and also the children themselves. And we call them restorative styles in Gloucestershire. And they are young people, you know, in primary school, they're year three is up to year six. And they, they see the conflicts happening in the playground. They sit down and they facilitate these conversations. They're not difficult questions. They're just questions that invite curiosity and, you know, they're open questions wanting to find out the truth. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about three truths. We talk about my truth, your truth and the truth. And anybody can do that. You don't need to be a senior leader to be able to have those skills to find out how this miscommunications happen because most conflict happens through miscommunication or not understanding the other person's perspective and it is just about sitting down and listening so anybody can have a restorative conversation wow we have to stop talking because the time <laughs> has flown by um i always like to end with um a, a kind of closing thought so i wondered if you if you each had a, a thought you'd like to to leave people with and i often take these out as just little sound bites so if someone just listened to you know just a minute of, of what you had to say what would you like to share with them well molly when we when we met to come up with to what we were going to say to you pookie um <laughs> molly <laughs> molly said something and it was so brilliant that i wrote it down and then i emailed it back to her so, <laughs> So she has like credit and rights on what she said so I don't want to steal it from her but I have it written down if you don't know what it is Molly. <laughs> you go for it Anna. <laughs> so Molly said that um, basically 
trauma-informed ways of working strength and restorative ways of working and vice versa so being knowledgeable about trauma helps to make restorative practices more informed and knowledge and skill of restorative practice helps make the notion of trauma more hopeful essentially what we've learned on our journey is that when you understand the impact that trauma has on you emotionally physically neurologically it's it's and then understanding what bruce perry talks about about creating a sense of safety about being able to regulate your emotions and having somebody to relate to enables you to be able to engage in restorative reflection so there's a brilliant quote from john dewey who says that we don't learn from experience we learn from reflecting on experience and that's the restorative element and what that reflection does when you use restorative language because it's non-blaming it enables you to be vulnerable it enables you to take responsibility for your own actions and it enables you to put right the harm that was caused that gives you a sense of resilience it gives you an emotional um, and social kind of skill set that will take you through life and working with young people and adults who are have experienced trauma just means that they, it doesn't work. so we get a lot in in training of saying well, it doesn't work with these kids it does you just need to spend more time on understanding the building blocks that come before that reflection so in order to engage in the reflection and put things right they need to have safety and emotional regulation and an emotional adult to relate to in place in order to engage in that conversation and it's that understanding the two come together because if you you can be trauma informed a restorative practice gives you the language with which to move on from the trauma from the incident of harm and be able to repair it. Mm -hmm.